Frida Kahlo once said, I am my own muse. I am the subject I know best, the subject I want to know better. She explored her identity through dozens of self-portraits and through her fashion by pairing traditional Mexican huipiles with colonial jewelry. Was Frida subconsciously painting her reality or was she also consciously constructing her own identity? Is it possible for artists to separate themselves from their artwork or is their alma, their soul, always present? I'm Maria Trujillo and this is Vive Arte, the Denver Art Museum podcast that brings art of the Americas to the forefront and shows you why it matters now. For this episode, we'll explore how artists integrate their complex identities and their practice with Danielle Seawalker and Justin Favela, both artists whose heritage is vital to their art practice. I want to say thank you, Danielle and Justin, for joining me today. I just want to give you each an opportunity to tell me a little bit about your heritage and how you engage with your own cultural roots in your art practice. Greetings, everybody. I'm Danielle Seawalker, and I am a Hunkpapa Lakota woman from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe in North Dakota, but I currently reside in Denver, Colorado. I am an artist, an activist, a mom of two sons, and a writer. My name is Justin Favela. I was born and raised in Las Vegas, Nevada. My mom is Guatemalan and my father is Mexican. So a lot of my work is investigating and discovering my own Latinx heritage and Latinx art. I would say that my main focus with my work is my identity and the complexities of that within the art world. And so I thought we would just talk a little bit about some projects that you guys have done in the semi-recent <laughs> past. Specifically, Danielle, I would love it if you could talk a little bit more about the Red Road project that you worked on and how that, you know, was really stemming in your cultural roots. The Red Road Project is a passion project of mine that I've been working on for about seven years with my best friend. She currently lives in London. We've always been very close friends for probably going on 20 years now. Mm-hmm. And her being of European descent and being in the United States and under and sharing my experiences as a Native American woman, she was always curious about that. And one day, several years ago, I was visiting her in London, and she brought up this news article that she had came across about Wounded Knee and some issues surrounding the land being for sale. And that kind of just stemmed into some deeper conversation about how we, we meaning, you know, basic majority of people, usually hear about all the issues surrounding Indian country and Native people, you know, all the the poverty, the alcoholism, the drugs, the high suicide rates, and the health disparities, et cetera. And um, I just, I told her, man, I really wish people knew Mm -hmm. the beauty of of Indian country and all the great resilient things that people are doing. None of that gets highlighted. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we're kind of having a few glasses of wine and one thing led to another. And we're like, let's just do it ourselves. And that night we decided we were going to share these stories. And we booked plane tickets that night back home to North Dakota, where I'm from. And I think a month later we were there and we just dove in and we started taking photos and gathering stories of people doing these positive things. And really what the Red Road Project has kind of evolved into is examining what it means to be Native American in the 21st century mm-hmm. from our perspectives and our voices. We no longer want to have, you know, outsiders telling our story for us. I wanted to give a platform to all these people to tell their own stories in their own words. And so today, here we are, and it's still a work in progress, but, you know, probably thousands of photos at this point, tons and tons of stories oh, wow. that we've collected. And it's been really great to share that firsthand perspective and knowledge Uh, I've seen the photographs. They're so intimate, I feel. Yeah. Thank you. And then Justin, Mm -hmm. I would love it if you could talk a little bit about the work you did for the Denver Art Museum, Fridalandia. Sure. Yeah. The work I did at the Denver Art Museum, I think, was really important because it was the first time I really dove into the representation of Latinx culture Mm -hmm. through more current pop culture. A lot of the work that I did before that was kind of like tongue in cheek, kind of this line between like exploiting symbols and celebrating the symbols of Latinidad that are kind of stereotypical. Mm -hmm. And so for the Denver Art Museum, I was already doing work about Jose Maria Velasco, which is a 19th century Mexican landscape painting, but I wanted to tie it to the Denver Art Museum in a way. And so when I went there, I saw the gallery spaces and the Mm -hmm. walls of this just wildly designed museum with no (laughs) straight 
like 90 degree walls. <laughs> oh my goodness. White people are wild. And so <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I really want to take over this gallery space and I want to do big murals instead of doing these small landscapes. So I kind of moved Jose Maria Velasco's 19th century landscape to a little bit more modern, you know, Mexican muralism, to give it a little nod to the Mexican muralism movement. And then I was looking at the collection and the Denver Art Museum has a huge pre-Columbian, you know, collection of, of artifacts and art. And so I thought that was very interesting. And then on top of that, I said, there's got to be another layer here. And I was looking and I always thought, It's like unsaid, but like, you know, a really easy target to make your work marketable Mm -hmm. as a Latinx person is Frida, right? You see it at vendor events, Mm -hmm. you see it, Mm -hmm. uh, you see people doing uh, portraits in homage of her or replicas of her work a lot or, you know, putting them on tote bags, whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I avoided making work about Frida for a long time for that reason, because Um, you know, it's kind of looked at as like kind of hacky, right? Like kind of cheap to do that, which I'm not saying that that's what it is, but, and you know, there's a lot of hierarchies within the art world that are unspoken. I guess what is it acceptable to display or the context to put Frida's life in, you know? So Mm -hmm. I know it's a touchy subject, but I wanted to do something about that because Frida is just like such an icon. And so I had trouble doing it until I saw the pre-Columbian connection, I said, this is it. Because when I, I remember watching the movie Frida and in that movie from 2001, I noticed that there was these scenes of Frida Kahlo's garden and there were these artifacts in it. And these pre-Columbian artifacts almost set up like lawn gnomes, which Mm -hmm. I thought was (laughs) insane. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But I understood why Frida did that because I understood her work and was like, okay, this is Frida and Diego. Like, tying themselves to the land, tying themselves to their indigeneity, or specifically Frida doing that. Mm -hmm. And so I took the images from the Casa Azul set from the movie Frida, and that became a whole new project now because I was really making work about the representation of Mexican artists through popular media, like movies, Mm -hmm. like these paintings, which back in the 19th century were super famous and also a symbol of the nation, just as Frida is now. I mean, Frida's on the money, right? So I took all of those ideas and kind of wrapped them into one big installation. So big piñata murals of Velasco's work on the walls, and then a piñata recreation of the set of Frida's garden from La Casa Azul in the center of the gallery. And then I made replicas of the Denver Art Museum's pre-Columbian collection Mm -hmm. out of paper mache and paper to set in place of the props that were in the movie. I mean, and now that we're kind of talking about Frida, I'm just interested in to hear both from your perspective, because, you know, you alluded to this already, Justin, whereas, Mm -hmm. like, you know, if you really want to grab someone's attention around, like, Mexican pop culture, people tend to go to Frida Kahlo right away. And I think that's probably for a lot of reasons, because she, you know, has a lot of different identities. You know, she was Latina, Latinx, she was, you know, bisexual, she had a disability, she was also claimed indigeneity as part of her background, too. Um, she was German and Mexican. I'm just kind of curious to hear what your thoughts on are on the way that she, both of you, on the way that she portrayed herself mm-hmm. and her artwork. I remember seeing a Frida Kahlo painting in, for the first time as a teenager. And I grew up in this small bubble in North Dakota, and I didn't even go to a museum probably till I was 16. And I remember just thinking, like, wow, this woman is painting these p- portraits of herself And she's emphasizing parts of herself that maybe aren't, you know, traditionally thought as as the most beautiful parts of a woman, Mm -hmm. you know, with her unibrow or emphasizing the mustache. And I just remember thinking, like, that's really raw and, and, and brave of her to do, especially during the time that she was becoming an artist. But I think that maybe came from... Her time healing from her tra- her accidents and, and the trauma that occurred with that and spending a lot of time with herself, examining herself. Um, and I really appreciated that. And she also just was not afraid to really address and express difficult topics that were probably tough to talk about publicly at the time, you know, the sexuality piece mm-hmm. and 
you know, infidelities within her relationships, things like that. So I, I really appreciate that rawness and that kind of truth that she portrays. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would agree with that. And so I have a, <laughs> I have an interesting relationship with what, how I think of Frida because it's kind of tainted a little bit by one of my friends who I do the podcast with, Emanuel Ortega, who really dislikes Frida, mm. and like, <laughs> I don't, I don't think she he dislikes Frida specifically, but the way that people idolize her mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. and erase um, like other artists because you know like sometimes that's all people think about when they think about Mexican art unfortunately so I have a podcast called Latinos Who Lunch and one of our first episodes was kind of dissecting Frida and kind of the inaccuracies in her biography mm-hmm. but the more I research I did on it the more I found myself being fascinated by Frida's identity because the way that my friend was looking at it was an exploitation Mm -hmm. of her culture because she was, you know, half German, you know, like part German, part Spanish, part Mexican. Some people think that there was some sort of identity crisis happening there. And then she was capitalizing on her Mexicanidad. Mm -hmm. And I find that very interesting. But the more I looked at Frida's life and the more research I did, the more I feel like she was playing all of us. And that playfulness, because I think a lot of people see her life as trauma, but that self-awareness, I should say, and that playfulness with it, I find fascinating and brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so instead of exploiting her own culture, which she was doing, I, I will, you know, like, that's just very clear. I also find it fascinating that she was playing everybody. She was playing all of us. She was playing all these white people like a (laughs) fiddle, okay? And I don't think people give her enough credit for that. And because she is a woman, what people want to focus on is her trauma instead of her playing the art world. This woman was one of the most important artists in the world. She still is. And that's not on accident. She didn't get on the cover of Vogue just because she painted a few paintings, but because she was a character, right? Mm -hmm. And in her day, she was an icon. And it's because she knew that. She knew she was a pioneer for feminist artists, for women artists, for queer artists, for Mexican artists. And she kind of played all those roles in her lifetime. I think she's one of the most misunderstood artists out there. You know, even the fact that her work is considered to be surrealist when in reality, Mm -hmm. she's like, painting her life, Absolutely, which was, yeah. you know, which was a novella in itself. Yes. And it's actually interesting that you say playfulness because mm-hmm. there's quite a few photographs in the exhibition at the Denver Art Museum that are very much in that tone of playfulness. She's like coyly looking at the camera, kind of inviting people into her home in a very personal way. But these pictures were displayed in a public way. So I think there's very much what you're saying, that construction of identity. Yeah. And like, just think about it. Like, one of her classic paintings, right? It's like her standing there with this like necklace made of spines and her her neck is bleeding and there's a hummingbird on it mm-hmm. and there's a monkey behind her and these tropical plants and a panther or some other wild animal. You could look at that and be like, oh, that's so fake. Like that doesn't exist in Mexico. What is she doing? Or you could look at it and be like, oh, she was probably like, all right, Y'all think I'm this, you know, indigenous Mexican Europeans? I'm going to give y'all what you want. Mm -hmm. And you're going to pay for a trip (laughs) for me to come visit you. And you know what I mean? Like, you can look at it in different ways. I think it's funny and I think it's great. But some people think, you know, it could be disrespectful. But again, like, the fact that, I mean, she was just so powerful and knew the power of her work, I think is so important when it comes to just thinking about those ideas. I think you're right. I think she definitely had a a strategy of branding herself and was very Mm -hmm. aware of that during that Mm -hmm. time. Yeah. I'm going to pause here to thank you for listening to Vida y Arte. It is vital in these uncertain times to support art institutions across the country. Consider becoming a member of the Denver Art Museum today. Members enjoy free general admission, Discounts on ticketed exhibitions like Frida Kahlo, Diego Rivera, and Mexican Modernism, plus much more. Visit denverartmuseum.org to learn more. And, you know, Frida called herself her own muse. And so have you guys ever thought of yourselves as the inspiration of your own artwork in a similar way that Frida has? 
Gosh, I don't think so. I've never really thought about myself as being a muse in my own art. But when I kind of think about that, you know, a lot of the inspiration that comes from what I create is drawn from my experiences, you know, the reservation, my childhood, my experiences, my old photographs, my ancestors. And so all of those are kind of a indirect compilation of who I am as a person. And so I guess, yeah, maybe that's an indirect way of saying that, you know, I am a muse of my own art. But as far as painting portraits of myself or anything like that, I haven't ever done that. But I'm absolutely inspired by my connection to my identity and my ancestors. Yeah. And I think when artwork is more personal, it's more relatable. Like you can just tell like when an artist is really invested in the work and I think about that a lot, like, you know, these like 19th century landscape piñata paintings that I'm known for now, which I thought I was only going to make a few, but here I am years <laughs> later great still I love them. making them. <laughs> oh my God. They will haunt me forever. But no, I love doing them. Please keep buying them. So, <laughs> but I find myself like enjoying work that I make that's more relatable to me or, you know, like Danielle's work, like documenting my family or and and my history I think I get the most joy out of doing that for sure even if it's in an indirect way yeah and as you mentioned kind of identity I kind of feel like all of us walk around with several identities to make our one larger identity right we privilege some voices over the others and so I'm just curious in your artwork do you ever feel the need to privilege one side of your identity over the other <laughs> I I actually have made a conscious decision to because I'm half Guatemalan, half Mexican, I feel like there's a lot of like Central American erasure uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to just like people ask me all the time. It's not a joke, which I can't believe it's real, but it is. I'll be like, oh, I'm from Guatemala and Mexico. And people will say, well, what part of Mexico is Guatemala in? Oh, oh no. <laughs> And I, uh, I just smile politely and slowly back away from that person. <laughs> so I've been, I think in the last maybe like two years, I have been more vocal and just more focused on, on my Guatemalan family and also like my Guatemalan identity and, and sharing, you know, just stories of my connection to Guatemala and I'm starting to do the research now. There's a lot going on right now in Guatemala that, you know, I didn't know the buildup to what's happening. But it's like it was a blind spot for even me because mm -hmm. living in the, you know, living in the in the West uh, here in the United States, the default Latino is Mexican, Mexican-American mm -hmm. or Chicano. Right. So mm -hmm. they kind of lump us all together. And so I think me being more vocal and celebrating my Guatemalan heritage more and more is a way for me to kind of counteract that because, you know, I don't know. I, I don't feel like Central American artists get the shine that they deserve, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It sounds also like you feel like there's, you have an, a sense of accountability to that part of your culture <laughs> to make it more visible. I can totally yeah. relate to that. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have a mother who's of Scandinavian descent and then my father, you know, born and raised on the reservation in Standing Rock. But I can definitely relate to what Justin's saying in that, you know, focusing on the one that's not shined or, you know, um, mm -hmm. highlighted as much. I honestly, I, I definitely privilege the Native American side. I mean, most of my artwork is is surrounded by that. And as I've been working on the Red Road Project, that photo documentary series, I've really just personally learned so much about other tribal people, other communities and how we're all connected despite, you know, having so many differences. And there is uh, so many stories to tell in my Native American side, whereas I, I look at, you know, the the Caucasian side and I'm thinking, they already done and told all their stories. You know, mm -hmm. I have nothing really much to say, but there's so many untold stories about this other side. So I would say absolutely I privilege that side. I kind of almost hate to even use the word privilege. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I definitely bring that side out. Yeah, because you feel like there's stories that are unheard yeah. or, or told in a perspective that's not, you know, Correct. genuine. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, history is always told in the perspective of the winner, and that's not necessarily always the accurate history in the story. Something that, I, that I've that i also been dealing with and, and reckoning, you know, you said privilege and like, you know, I've always been like the funny Mexican friend or Guatemalan friend, mostly Mexican, because, you know, like I said, nobody knows about Guatemalans, but <laughs> not realizing my own white privilege and male privilege because 
I feel like I was a little bit conditioned to be like, I'm brown and down for life, you know, like, <laughs> and I didn't really see myself as maybe the rest of the world saw me. And I think the last maybe five years, I've really been more conscious about how I take up space and like my white privilege, you know, like my proximity to whiteness. And those are really weird and tough conversations mm -hmm. to have, especially for white people or, you know, white Latinos, because mm -hmm. <laughs> there's just a lot of talk right now about privilege and struggle and, you know, the struggle Olympics that everybody likes to play. But it's like when you give yourself that reality check and sometimes I realize like, oh, am I being like a white savior right now mm -hmm. and saying like, look at me giving shine to these people, putting a spotlight on them. Like that's kind of gross, you know, yeah. and I've been really thinking about that and how to do that because it is important to give visibility to the people when you have a platform that you want to, you know, to bring up, you know, with you. And I've learned over the last maybe couple of years, it's like sometimes it's better to be more personal about your own experience, be honest um, instead of being the savior and just tell your own story. Mm -hmm. um, and then when people are telling their stories, maybe just be quiet and let them take up the space, you know? Because mm -hmm. even this idea of like letting people take up space, that shows that you're the gatekeeper at that moment. Just using that word let, mm -hmm. which I was actually, when I was doing a talk once, somebody mentioned that, like you keep saying the word let, which implies that you're the one in power. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh snap, I am the one in power. <laughs> I am the gatekeeper. I am the people I'm talking about. <laughs> and then I went and like ate a pint of ice cream and cried in my hotel room, right? But Aww. like, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it's just really complicated, but it's really important. And I'm like so happy that people are having these conversations openly because mm -hmm. I don't think I would have thought of that if yeah. this was me 10 years ago, you know, in mm -hmm. the same place in my career that I am. Yeah, and I think also the way that we perceive what we're doing and the way that others see what we're doing can sometimes doesn't necessarily jive. And so that kind of leads me to another question I had for you both, which was, is there a disparity between the way you see your artwork and the way that others have perceived it? Or if you, there's an example where you're like, wow, I never would have thought that they would have looked at it like that. Gosh, a lot of the visual artwork that I do and paintings and things like that are really, I kind of mentioned it earlier, come from archival imagery or even documents like treaties, like Indian treaties that have been broken. And so I incorporate a lot of these historical documents and pieces into my work as a way to bring awareness, I guess, for it, but also just a way for me to kind of like get that out for myself. But gosh, I was at an art market recently and somebody came up and said something about it. And number one, they thought the portrait that I'd painted was a woman and it was actually a male. So number one, I was like, what the heck? No, this is a guy. How do you not see this? But then also then they started talking about, well, what was the treaty or what's reservation life like? And so just I kind of – I don't think about that people don't always understand these things. <laughs> Even if they're American and live in this country and this is a big part of the country is Native American reservations and Absolutely. Native American history. And I'm like, wow, there's just a lot of misunderstandings or – just, you know, they don't know what they don't know, I guess. And so it drums up a lot of great conversation that I'm always happy to have. But definitely there's misunderstandings out there. And and one thing that kind of bugged me recently that also occurred during that same conversation was, oh, wow, I really am a fan of your art, Danielle. But are you – is this authentic? Are you actually Native American? Because I would only want to support or buy your art if you're really Native. Interesting. That really – kind of kept me up at night for a few days thinking like, wow, this is what people think. And they're judging my work based on maybe who I am as a person, my identity. And if I have that enrollment paper, that government issued paper that says, yes, she has a blood quantum of being authentic native, you know, or whatever that means. Uh, I just found that quite interesting. So yeah, that's got me thinking quite a bit these days. I actually have two examples of the way that my work was perceived from the Fridalandia exhibit mm. at the Denver Art Museum. One of them that was very moving was I was actually in the process of installing the murals and they would bring school groups by to give them a kind of behind the scenes while I was making it with my team. And it was this, this, uh, this, this class of probably like second graders or third graders. 
And it was like brown and white kids. And it was like a nice mix of kids. And then one of the white kids is like, oh, my gosh, look at all those post-it notes <laughs> on the wall. <laughs> and then one of the little brown kids slaps him on the shoulder. And he's like, those aren't post-it notes. This is a pinata, dummy. Right? Aww. And so that <laughs> moment just like filled my heart with joy because I was like, wow, this kid knew what this was immediately and like this artwork didn't have to be translated for him mm. in this space where normally everything has to be translated for people of color or people that aren't used to a museum experience or whatever culture they're looking at, right? Absolutely. So that was really cool. And then on the flip side, after the exhibit went up, I think it was the opening of Mi Tierra, an older woman came up to me and, you know, was happy to meet me and she thanked me for the installation and that was so cool. And then she whispered in my ear and she said, you know, I really like your installation because unlike all the other ones here, this one's not political. It's just nice. And, hmm. and, and I was like, huh, oh, okay, okay, you know, <laughs> and so... I'm thinking, oh, I don't think she really knows like what I'm trying to say with this. And so that showed me like people see what they want to see That's within right. artwork sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes you have to hit people over the head to like get a message through. But after that experience, I think I realized that I needed to be more vocal and maybe a little bit more forward through my work when mm -hmm. it came to political issues or social justice issues to make it crystal clear, right? Because I feel like before that, I knew that I was purposely being a little bit more neutral because I wanted to keep booking them gigs, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, it's what we have to do as artists sometimes. But after that experience, I remember the feeling I had afterward and I'm like, oh, I don't think that, that was a really great critique actually of my installation. And I really built from that after that incident you know? she was congratulating me for, <laughs> yes, for right. being so neutral yeah yeah i think too when you think about like aesthetics and how something looks so aesthetically pleasing and it draws you in and then you know taking it a step further saying what's the message here what is the artist trying to say and i think you're right if they don't want to experience that or examine that it's hard to get the people that are viewing the artwork there where you want them to be yeah especially like making work out of tissue paper and the colors are so bright, it's mm. automatically people think like, oh, this is a kid's thing, you mm. know? And so some people can't see past that. They don't work past that, you know? And some people understand and, and see that there's many layers to the installation and what it's actually saying. So yeah, I like that. It's like just aesthetically, visually pleasing. That's always a bonus, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, artists always have a method behind that mm. madness. And it's so good. It's so I always appreciate those comments, even if like it's a hard mm -hmm. pill to swallow in the moment. You're like, but that's not what I was trying to say or get across. But I think that you take those words and you really that's how you evolve as an artist. And mm -hmm. you say, all right, well, moving forward, I'm going to do X, Y, Z based on, I guess, these perceptions. So, yeah, I think it's it's good. I think that there is a sense of like artists are holding you culturally accountable for like a larger group of people. And do you ever feel that pressure in your work? I guess these days I, I kind of do. I guess it depends on what I'm working on. So when it comes to the Red Road Project where I am involving people of my community, I absolutely feel pressure to be much more diligent and culturally aware on, you know, making sure I'm portraying their story correctly or, you know, getting their name correctly in their own language or, you know, whatever. But when it comes to my, what I would do personally, I kind of just – I just go for it and whatever I'm feeling, it's it's much more personal to me and I don't care as much what mm -hmm. everybody else would think about it. I think my message now is like, hey, this work is very personal to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can tie it back to these notions of authenticity and like my own community checking me on that and being mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, you're not really down, you know, or like you're not really Mexican if you like this or you're not really Guatemalteco if you're like this. And I feel like I've been very empowered by my podcast, Latinos Who Lunch, but by the listeners who mm -hmm. email us with these identity crises all the time, like about not feeling tied to their Latinx roots because maybe they don't like 
conchas and to, and uh you know like the the typical like oh my god i don't like selena so i guess i'm not chicano you know it's like <laughs> i think again there was a flip a few years ago where i'm like oh i want to be the representative for those people for the mm -hmm. pochos for the people for the latinx people that don't speak spanish mm -hmm. for you know the kids that were adopted and obviously look latinx but don't share the same culture like they are just as again they don't need to quantify <laughs> their Latinidad, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. With like, w you know, what they do every day. Like you are Latino no matter what. And so I think that's kind of my my messaging now when before it was like, oh, I'm going to dig up this art historical reference and put a spin on it, you know, because representation matters and I want to show this art in a new light. I mean, I'm like, well, is that interesting to me? No, I, what's more interesting to me is like, just validating people's existence that mm -hmm. feel like they don't have a culture because their own culture has rejected them, which is mm -hmm. so messed up, you know? Yeah. So in that sense, I feel like I'm a representative of that community now. And then also just r really simply, like I'm from Vegas. Las Vegas isn't known as a, like a art town, right? We're not known for our contemporary art. So I also feel responsible. I think the most responsibility I feel is to represent Las Vegas and show people that artists come out of here, like on a, on a different level when it comes to my identity. And it's interesting because, Justin, you were talking about all of these different identities that we have together. You know, there's, you know, the part of you that's from Las Vegas. There's the part of you that's Guatemalteco, the part that's Mexican, the part that is trying to be a voice for all these other people that feel on the outside, too. And I feel like that would be the same, right, Danielle? Like that you have yeah. the Scandinavian part of you, and then you have also mm. this indigenous part of you. Yeah. And and finding that balance between portraying all of these different identities in your work. Absolutely. And it's it's even like broken down within the indigenous native side. I mean, I, I grew up in North Dakota and I was very much present on the reservation. My family all still lives there, but then now I live in the city and there's this concept of urban natives. And so there's even like having, you know, to prove yourself like, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I definitely know what a reservation's like, you know, I'm, I'm a res native versus, oh no, I'm an urban native. So mm. there's definitely identities within the identity, which is an interesting thing that I could probably talk about for ages, but absolutely. There's definitely been a problem, an identity crisis, specifically when it comes to indigenous peoples, with when it comes to colonization and all the mm -hmm. cultural genocide attempts and forced assimilations and, you know, being reprimanded and punished physically, emotionally, spiritually for wanting to speak your own language or dress the way you want to dress. I mean, gosh, two generations ago from me, we weren't even considered American citizens. Mm -hmm. We didn't even have the full rights to vote in this country until the 1960s. So there's definitely an identity crisis. Like, where do we belong? Who really, who are we? If we can't practice who, where we come from and who we are, but yet we're not allowed to really fully be part of this American society either. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's created a lot of problems today. And it's, uh, I definitely think about that when I create Artwork, yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's a very kind of public act making artwork. You know, you'd make it in your studio, you make it in the, on the street, but, you know, you're you're being exposed. And so mm. what would you say to an artist beginning this kind of introspective journey that may be struggling with how to portray themselves or how to put their work out in the world? I feel like I'm still struggling with that today. I mean, gosh, it's taken me a long time to really feel comfortable and confident to put my work out there. And if it wasn't for the encouragement of people around me and people, you know, family, friends, even strangers on the street who I, you know, interacted with by chance and happened to see my art saying, hey, why aren't you putting this out there? And finally listening to that and taking that leap. It was really scary for me because creating art is so personal for me. It's really like my diary or my journal. And it creates and exposes my vulnerable side and makes me feel super vulnerable. But it's been so great. And I think what I would say is just go for it. Listen to the words of encouragement. Put yourself out there. It is scary. But since I've been able to do that, it's just really opened a lot of doors for me. I've been able to create murals and write books and do so many different things creatively that I wouldn't have been able to do had I not just taken that next step, which literally was just the next step of opening that door and putting it out there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I would definitely agree with you in the sense of I don't even know who I am right now, right? <laughs> and I think that's seen as like a scary negative thing, but I think it's a very positive thing because that means that you want to find out who you are and what you stand for. And I think my message all the time, especially to younger artists, is like what you think your values and, you know, what the world is five years ago should definitely evolve. Like you shouldn't think the same thing you thought years ago. Mm. You should keep learning. I think you should use your artwork to investigate that and discover who you are. And instead of thinking about it as, okay, I'm going to make this piece to authentically show people who I am. I think of my work as like, okay, I'm trying to figure it out. And you're along, you're, you're coming along with me on this journey, you know? So maybe not putting so much pressure on yourself. And again, just being more playful and not taking yourself so seriously, because when you give yourself the liberty to play, you know, no culture, no person, you know, is a monolith and represents exactly what their culture is. You can only really represent your own yourself and your story. And even that story sometimes isn't the real one, right? So I think making art as an artist right now and is really about self-discovery in, mm -hmm. in, a, in, a, in a huge sense. Absolutely. Well, great. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Justin, so much for for this conversation. I've learned so much and I've given us a lot to think about. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. It's been a really good dialogue. Mm -hmm. Gives me some things to think about now. I want yeah. to go home and create. Great. <laughs> thank you, Justin and Danielle, for taking the time to meet with me today. I look forward to seeing what you both do next. Click on the link in the podcast description to learn more about Danielle C. Walker and Justin Vavela's artwork, where you can also download a Spanish transcript of this show. Thank you. Gracias for listening to Be Arte. The exhibition is on view at the Denver Art Museum through January 24, 2021. The music was created and provided by Jared Katz, Adolfo Romero, and Nativo Studios. This podcast was produced by Postmodern Company in Denver, Colorado. For more episodes like this, make sure to subscribe to Vive Arte on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.